My name is Anna. I'm an editor at one of the big publishing houses downtown, just a regular girl who likes to keep things straightforward. Life's always been a hustle, what with juggling deadlines and squeezing in some me time. That's probably why I never really got into the whole dating scene much. I preferred my own company, usually with a good book or a quiet walk in the park near my apartment. But, that all changed one sunny Saturday that seemed just like any other. I was deep into a podcast, strolling along without a care in the world. The park was buzzing with people and their pets, kids running around, it was lively. I guess I lost track of where I was walking because the next thing I knew, a guy on a bicycle nearly collided with me. Watch it, he yelled, swerving at the last second. His tone was harsh, the annoyance clear in his voice. I'm so sorry. I blurted out, pulling out one earbud. I hadn't realized I'd wandered onto the bike path. He stopped his bike and turned around, looking more amused than angry now. You gotta watch where you're going. This path's a jungle sometimes. Yeah, my bad. Totally my fault. I admitted, feeling a bit embarrassed. I brushed a stray lock of hair from my face and gave him a sheepish smile. He laughed, and just like that, the tension dissolved. I'm Tom, he said, extending a hand. Anna, I replied, shaking his hand. His grip was firm, confident. So, Anna, always this distracted, or is it just my charming presence? He had this cheeky grin that made me chuckle. Just a long week at work. My brain's off enjoying the weekend already. Fair enough. I was just about to grab a coffee at that place over there. He pointed to a small cafe at the edge of the park. Care to join me? You know, as a peace offering for almost sending me flying. I considered it for a moment. He seemed nice, and honestly, I could use a coffee. Sure, why not? I could use a good coffee story to tell. As we walked to the cafe, Tom was easy to talk to. He told me about his job at a car sales company and how he liked to spend his weekends biking or hanging out with friends. He wasn't from the city, he moved here because he thought it offered more opportunities. You know, big city dreams and all that, he said with a smirk. I shared a bit about my job too, how I loved books and ended up making a career out of that passion. Beats being stuck in a cubicle doing something you hate, I added. We reached the cafe and ordered our coffees. While we waited, I couldn't help but notice how comfortable I felt around him. It was strange because usually, I'm a bit reserved around new people. But with Tom, the conversation just flowed. After meeting Tom, we started hanging out more. He was funny and easygoing, but it wasn't long before I started noticing little things that bugged me. It was nothing major at first, just small comments here and there that made me raise an eyebrow. One Saturday, we decided to go out for dinner, and somehow, the topic of careers and family came up. We were just chatting about work and life, nothing serious, or so I thought. So, how's the book world treating you? Tom asked, taking a sip of his beer. It's busy, as always. Deadlines don't stop for anyone. I replied, poking at my salad. Yeah, I get that. But you wouldn't want to be stuck in that forever, right? I mean, eventually, you'd want to settle down, maybe cut back on the work hours. He said, casually. I paused, fork midair. Not really, Tom. I love what I do. I don't see myself giving it up anytime soon or ever, really. Tom shrugged. Sure, but what about when we have kids? Wouldn't you want to be around more? The question caught me off guard. We? I chuckled nervously. That's jumping way ahead, don't you think? He laughed it off. Yeah, you're right. Just thinking out loud, I guess. I tried to shake off the discomfort, but it lingered. A couple of weeks later, Tom invited me to have dinner with his parents. I figured it was a good sign, things getting serious and all. I was nervous, but hopeful. That dinner, though, it opened my eyes a bit more. His parents lived in a cozy, well-kept house in the suburbs. His mom, Mrs. Reed, was all smiles when we arrived. 
Anna, so lovely to finally meet you. Tom has told us so much about you. She gushed, pulling me into a hug. Thank you for having me, Mrs. Reed. It's great to meet you too, I managed to say, returning her smile. Dinner was served, and everything was going well until Mrs. Reed started talking about family and marriage. You know, Tom was always the responsible one. She began, serving herself some more potatoes. We've always told him the importance of finding a good girl who knows her way around the house. Tom's dad nodded. Absolutely. It's about building a good foundation, you know? A man needs to provide, and a woman, well, she takes care of the home. I glanced at Tom, hoping he'd say something, but he just focused on his food. Mrs. Reed continued. It's how we raised our boys. Family first, right Tom? Right, Mom. Tom said, finally looking up. His agreement felt like a punch to the gut. I tried to keep my cool. It's interesting because I've always been pretty career-oriented. I love my job, and I believe in contributing equally. Mrs. Reed smiled, a bit too sweetly. Of course, dear. But you'll see, priorities change when you start having children. It's only natural for a woman to want to stay at home with her babies. The rest of the evening, I felt like I was in a fog. We left shortly after dinner, and on the drive back, the air between us was tense. Your mom has some strong opinions about family roles, I said, breaking the silence. Do you see things that way too? He hesitated, then said, I think there's some truth to it. I mean, it worked for my parents. Despite the uneasy dinner with Tom's parents, our relationship marched forward. Somehow, the good times seemed to outweigh the bad, and I found myself agreeing to marry him. Looking back, love must have blinded me because those warning bells were still ringing in the back of my mind. The wedding planning started, and it was all a whirlwind. Tom wanted something simple, and so did I. We decided on a modest ceremony with just close family and friends. As the day approached, the real pressure began to mount, not about the event, but about what our lives would become afterward. After the ceremony, at the reception, Tom's mom pulled me aside. Her smile was wide, but her eyes were serious. Anna, dear, I'm so happy for you both. Remember, a good wife supports her husband, no matter what. Thank you, Mrs. Reed. I intend to be a supportive partner. I replied, trying to keep my voice steady. And remember, dear, when the babies start coming, it's best if you're at home. You can't trust strangers to raise your children. Her words felt like a warning, and the finality in her tone made my stomach turn. I just nodded, not trusting myself to speak. Later, Tom and I had a moment alone. Your mom talked to me about, kids and me not working, I started, watching his reaction closely. Yeah? She's just looking out for the future. She means well, Anna. You know how moms are. Tom brushed it off, taking a sip of his champagne. But you know I'm not planning to quit my job, right? Even when we have kids, I pressed, needing him to understand. Tom paused, his face serious. We'll see, Anna. Things change. We'll do what's best for our family. After our wedding, Tom suggested we move to a larger apartment, closer to his work at the car sales company. The place was nice, bigger than our old one, but it was right next door to his parents' house. I had my suspicions about why he chose this particular spot, but I agreed, hoping for the best. Once settled, the reality of our new life together began to surface. Tom started bringing up his idea of a traditional family more often, where he would be the breadwinner and I would handle the household and eventually, the kids. One evening, we sat down with our finances spread across the dining table, a mess of bills and budgets under the dim light. I tried to show him how keeping both our jobs was more beneficial, especially with the economy being unstable. Look at these numbers, Tom. With both incomes, we're not just getting by, we're actually saving. It makes no sense for me to quit my job, I said, pointing at the spreadsheet. Tom shook his head, pushing the papers away slightly. It's not just about the money, Anna. It's about having a real family life. 
you know, like my parents had. I sighed, my frustration growing. But it's not the past, Tom. Things are different now, we both need to contribute. He didn't seem convinced, and the discussion ended with a heavy silence. The situation got more complicated with his mother, Mrs. Reed, living so close. She dropped by often, unannounced, each visit with a new critique about how I was managing our home. One afternoon, I was sorting through some work emails when she came in. Without a greeting, she started inspecting the house, wiping her finger along the bookshelf, looking for dust. Anna, you really should focus more on keeping a cleaner house. A dusty home is not a healthy home, she said, her tone sharp. I clenched my teeth, trying to keep my cool. I cleaned yesterday, Mrs. Reed. And I work full time. It's just a little dust. That's just it, you work too much. If you were home more, maybe things wouldn't slip through. She countered, walking over to the linen closet next. She pulled out a sheet, checking for any signs of improper laundering. I followed her, my hands balled into fists at my sides. I manage my time just fine, Mrs. Reed. Tom and I are both happy with how things are. She tootayed, shaking her head as she moved to the kitchen to scrutinize the contents of our fridge. A woman's place is taking care of her home and her husband. These modern ideas about women needing careers are nonsense. Every comment stung, and I felt my defenses rise. Maybe that worked for you, but I'm not you. I won't just quit my job to become someone I'm not. When Tom came home that evening, I tried to explain how suffocating his mother's visits were becoming. He listened, but his response chilled me. Mom's just trying to help, Anna. She has a lot of experience running a home. But it's our home, not hers. I need you to stand up for me for us, I pleaded. Tom looked torn, but he finally said, she's my mom, Anna. She means well. We should at least consider her advice. The argument that night was long and painful. We went to bed angry, the first of many silent nights. As the days turned into weeks, I felt more like an intruder in my own home, constantly judged and found wanting. The pressure to conform to an outdated idea of a wife was relentless, and my resolve to maintain my independence was tested every day. As the months rolled by, Tom's nagging about me not pulling my weight at home started to increase. He'd come home from work, look around with a scowl, and comment on the dusty shelves or the dinner that was either too bland or overcooked, because I'd rushed it after a long day at the publishing house. His favorite refrain became, if you can't manage both, maybe you shouldn't be working. One evening, after a particularly harsh critique of some slightly undercooked pasta, Tom let it drop. Anna, I'm serious. If you can't meet me halfway and take care of the house properly, maybe we should rethink this whole arrangement, he said, implying that a divorce was on the table. I loved Tom, despite everything. I didn't want our marriage to fail over something like this, so I made a decision that pained me deeply. The next day, I talked to my boss, Ellen, about quitting my job to become a full-time housewife. Ellen was shocked and tried to persuade me otherwise. Anna, you're one of our best. Are you sure about this? She asked, concern etching her features. I don't see any other way, Ellen. I have to try to make things work at home, I admitted, feeling defeated. Ellen, ever the problem solver, proposed a compromise. What if you could work from home? Manage your projects remotely. It's becoming more common now. You wouldn't have to quit. The idea seemed like a lifeline. I agreed to the arrangement, but decided not to tell Tom. Instead, I told him I had resigned. He was overjoyed, thinking I had chosen our home life over my career. So, I started my new job as a housewife, seeing Tom off to work each morning and greeting him when he came home. But as soon as he left, I'd power up my laptop and dive into my editing work. It was a strange double life, but it worked. The money I earned from my remote job, I secretly saved in a separate bank account, just in case. However, living on just Tom's salary was tougher than we'd thought. Despite my best efforts to economize, three months later, we were scraping the bottom of the barrel. I tried to bring up the topic gently. 
Tom, I think it might be necessary for me to go back to work. We're running through our savings too fast. Tom's reaction was swift and angry. That's because you're spending too much. You need to learn how to save properly, he snapped. I was stunned. I hadn't bought anything for myself in months and always hunted for the cheapest deals at the supermarket. His words hurt deeply, and I felt a mix of anger and humiliation. The next day, his mother came over with a mission to teach me proper budgeting. She dragged me to the store and pointed out the cheapest, often poorest quality products. Buy these, Anna. Stop wasting money on expensive stuff. She lectured as we walked down the aisles. Back home, she showed me how to dilute dish soap to make it last longer. You use too much. You need to make do with less, she instructed, her tone patronizing. She even started checking my receipts, scolding me for any purchase she deemed unnecessary. Why are you buying this? Just stick to basics, she would say, shaking her head in disapproval. Living like this was unbearable. Every day felt more suffocating than the last. I was losing my sense of self to their imposed austerity, living under constant surveillance. The situation was becoming untenable. I was trapped in a life of pretended submission, and every part of me screamed for escape. But for now, I held on, biding my time, and planning my next steps carefully. It all reached a boiling point one drizzly Tuesday evening. I was on the phone in the living room, pouring my heart out to my mom. I just don't know how much more I can take, mom. His mother is constantly over here, teaching me how to stretch a dollar until it screams. I get it, we need to save, but this is too much. Mom's voice was a mix of concern and anger. Anna, that's not normal. You need to have a conversation with Tom about boundaries. It's your home too, not just his or his mother's playground. Just as I was nodding, feeling a bit strengthened by my mom's support, Tom stormed in from the other room, his face red with anger. He must have heard me complaining. He snatched the phone right out of my hand. A wife shouldn't be complaining about her husband and mother-in-law, like some street gossip, he snapped into the phone before hanging up. I was shocked, my hands shaking a bit. Tom, you can't just grab my phone and talk to my mom that way. Oh, I can't. Maybe if you had some respect for us, I wouldn't have to. His voice was rising, and I could see the veins in his neck bulging. Tom, listen to yourself. Can't you see this isn't healthy? I pleaded, hoping to reach some part of him that remembered what love felt like. But he was beyond reason. Healthy? My mom was right. I should never have married you. His words cut deeper than I would have expected. That's enough, Tom. I'm your wife, not some puppet you and your mom can control. I shot back, my own anger flaring up now. Then act like it or leave, he shouted, his face just inches from mine. I stared at him, disbelief and sadness warring inside me. You want me to leave? At 4 a.m.? It's dark and pouring rain outside. If you don't like how things are, then yes, get out. His eyes were cold, unyielding. I knew then that nothing I could say would change his mind or the situation. Shaking, I grabbed a few essentials, my laptop, some clothes, and my phone. I went for my purse next, but Tom was quicker. He grabbed it first, holding it out of my reach. You think you're leaving with this? I earned this money, not you. Fine, keep it, I said, my voice hollow. I couldn't believe this was happening. I called a taxi and waited by the door, my heart pounding. The taxi pulled up, and I stepped out into the cold night air, the rain drenching me immediately. As I climbed into the car, a sense of surreal calm settled over me. I was doing this. I was leaving. At the hotel, as I lay in the unfamiliar bed, I couldn't help but feel a surge of relief amidst the turmoil. Despite everything, I hadn't quit my job. My secret savings account, unknown to Tom, was now my lifeline. The first light of dawn was barely peeking through the curtains when I got up. I hadn't slept much, the weight of my decision pressing down on me through the night. Today was the day I would take control back. 
I had an appointment with a lawyer to talk about filing for divorce. It felt surreal, like a scene from someone else's life, not mine. The lawyer's office was a stark, unassuming place, tucked between a row of old brick buildings. Inside, Mr. Henderson, my lawyer, was a straight-talking man who wasted no time. Let's get down to business, he said as soon as I sat down. You're here to file for divorce, correct? Yes, I confirmed, my voice steadier than I expected. I can't go back to the way things were. Mr. Henderson nodded, his face serious. All right, I'll need all the details. Any joint accounts, property, anything that needs untangling. We spent the next hour going over everything. He explained the legal process, what I could expect, and what my rights were. He was thorough, ensuring I understood every step before drawing up the necessary documents. You'll need to serve these to your husband, he instructed as he handed me the envelope, sealed with a stamp that felt like the seal on my old life. Armed with the divorce papers, I went back to the apartment I had shared with Tom. He was still asleep, probably exhausted from last night's fallout. The apartment felt different as I packed my things, every item I tucked away marked the end of another shared chapter. By the time I finished packing, Tom was stirring. He wandered into the kitchen, bleary-eyed and clearly confused to see my bags piled by the door. What's going on, he mumbled, scratching his head. I didn't have much to say, just actions to take. Instead of answering, I handed him the envelope. These are for you, I said, my voice void of the emotion I felt churning inside. Tom tore open the envelope, a frown forming, as he scanned the contents. Divorce? He laughed, disbelief lacing his tone. You think you can just walk out and everything will be all right? He looked up from the papers, his eyes cold. Come back when you're ready to apologize, and maybe I'll consider taking you back. But remember, you'll have to listen to my mother from now on. The absurdity of his words almost made me laugh, but I held it back. I'm not coming back, Tom. I'm done. We're done. Walking out of that apartment, the air felt different, crisper, almost hopeful. I went straight to a new place I had rented days before, small, but mine alone, a place where I could start rebuilding. Each step felt heavy, but right. A few weeks after moving in, I was back at the office, fully immersing myself in the whirlwind of publishing deadlines and author meetings. Being around my colleagues again, feeling the familiar rush of a fast-approaching deadline, it reignited a spark in me that I thought I had lost. Days at the office turned into weeks, and soon, I was back to my old routine, juggling manuscripts and deadlines with a newfound efficiency, fueled by my recent personal upheavals. It felt good to be back, really good. The familiar landscape of texts and typos was more comforting than I could have imagined. During this time, I reconnected with old friends, people who had known me long before Tom. We gathered for drinks after work, shared meals on weekends, and slowly, I started feeling more like myself than I had in years. Their laughter and light-hearted teasing grounded me, and in their company, I rediscovered parts of myself I'd forgotten. A few months into this new phase of my life, an unexpected call came. It was Tom. His voice was awkward, tinged with a desperation I wasn't prepared to handle. Hey, uh, I got laid off. Things are pretty rough. He started, his words stumbling over each other. I was thinking, maybe you could help me out? Financially? The request hung in the air, audacious and somewhat insulting, given our history. And, you know, maybe we could start over. Rebuild. I mean, if you apologize to me and my mom, show some commitment here. His voice trailed off, hopeful yet uncertain. I couldn't help it, I burst out laughing. The sheer absurdity of his proposal, after everything, was too much. Tom, you really think I'd come back, support you and your parents, after you kicked me out? You're out of your job, and suddenly all your high and mighty principles flew out the window? There was a pause on the line. So, that's a no? He sounded smaller somehow, deflated. Tom, I'm doing well. Really well. And honestly, I'm enjoying my freedom too much to give it up again. I hope you find your feet, but it won't be with me. 
my words were firm, the final nail in the coffin of our relationship. After hanging up, I felt a surge of empowerment. Tom's call, although ridiculous, had affirmed something vital for me. I was truly free now, and no offer or plea was going to change that.